too kind. No, really, you're too kind. You haven't heard my talk yet. Um, actually, here's a question. It's Saturday night. Why are you here? <laughs> I suppose, obstinately, I already know the answer to that question. Um, so here is the title of my talk. Uh, it could be misleading. It might not be. Um, I have some affiliations, but they might be made up. Um, so I'll let you decide as to uh, what's relevant and what isn't. What is really annoying is that you evenly distributed in this room across two different slides and there's only one of me. So we'll just decide how to proceed from here, shall we? Um, I have some other, uh, uh, some other roles and other affiliations as well. Um, I uh, have a martial arts school. It's called the Orgel School of Movement Arts, Hapkido, and Kung Fu. Um, I might play the demo reel a little bit later on when I'm feeling less shy. Um, uh, we're on Facebook, Orgel School of Movement Arts, as I said already. Um, I also performed in various shows that you've probably uh, heard of or been to in and around the Chicago and uh, Milwaukee area. Uh, these are real life. Yeah, that's me as well. Um, <laughs> have an improv troupe uh, where we pretend to be pirates, uh, actually historical pirates, and say extraordinarily stupid and silly things. Um, so there's going to be, um, oh, there is a reason why I mention this. It's not just because I've got fantastic costumes. Um, it's part of my personal therapy, and it's part of my background and autobiography. And I think it's really important for talks like this for your speakers to try and connect with, to try and connect with you. And that means telling you a little bit about themselves as well. So that might help you, might help you feel a little less awkward um, about a man in tight red pants uh, being the presenter for tonight's uh, presentation as well. Um, are these lights under my control? Could there not be? Could we turn off the ones towards the front or turn them down? Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate that. Um, there's gonna, uh, do I have about 45 minutes or so? Fantastic. Okay, lock the doors. Uh, no, seriously. <laughs> um, going to uh, concentrate on three broad areas, and each of these areas, the traumatic brain injury, the dinosaur reborn, I, I made that up earlier on this afternoon, um, and uh, engineering new body tissues, uh, each of those topics is going to be shorter as we go on. So as you get tired and the oxygen concentration goes down in the room, you'll have less and less far to go with each topic. Don't, think, don't say I never gave you anything. Um, so what, when I say what do we do, I, have, I, I do genuinely wear multiple different metaphorical hats as to who I am and who am I affiliated with. So when I say what we do, I'm mostly talking about the academic group that I run at the Illinois Institute of Technology where it holds my tenure and pays my bills and allows me to not get cold and wet at night and instead uh, be snuggly under my suburban roof. Um, so what we do uh, in, uh, in terms of the scientific and engineering work we do, we characterize, and then from the characterization of what we learn from whatever it is we've been characterizing, um, develop technologies. So we seek, if you like, it's an odyssey, and then we enterprise, we make something. We are both basic and apply technology. We um, are both male and female, no, that's the wrong talk. Um, we also, um, we also do theoretical work. We do molecular dynamics uh, simulations of, uh, on structures that we have developed from experimental protocols. We do applied technology uh, development. I uh, have been part of a project for developing advanced body army, armor with the US uh, Army. I was a very, very, very tiny uh, part of that particular project, but a much bigger member, uh, actually the PI, uh, of other projects that involve defining the molecular structure of connective tissues and their response in situations we call mechanical loading, which in other times might be called an owie. Um, other times it might be called fatal, other times it might be called uh, a lifelong chronic condition that you have to carry with you, and the effects are not immediately known. Um, so without further ado, uh, this, is, uh, this is my toy. I'm sorry, this is an instrument that I use. Um, it's called the Advanced Photon Source. It's a synchrotron. It's a particle accelerator uh, based at Argonne, Illinois. And uh, this is the sector of which I'm associate, uh, one of the associate directors for. Uh, and I run a scientific program that concentrates on characterizing connective tissue structures at molecular 
uh, resolutions and also the brain malady um, series of experiments that we run there with collaborators from all over the world. Um, I, I suppose I should say that the, the whole connective tissue thing um, is, is something that I built up from the ground up. I'm obviously not responsible for connective tissues, that's some other gentleman or lady, um, but I am uh, largely responsible for a modern revelation in understanding how they're put together. And because we have an understanding of how they're put together, we have an understanding of how to put them back together when there is a condition, an injury, or a disease. So let's talk a little bit about traumatic brain injury. So this will be the first of those three topics, remember? Traumatic brain injury. Um, traumatic brain injury is a brain injury that occurs when there's a trauma. Okay, it, it is actually one of these instances that is relatively logical in the, in the nomentrica. Um, what actually happens in a traumatic brain injury um, is more complicated than I can use words in the space of this small amount of time uh, to tell you. Um, other than to say, other than to generalize, a mechanical loading incident occurs. It could be a slow, high pressure incident, relatively slow, say college football, um, or it could be a very fast event, such as a bullet to the head, um, or it could be somewhere in between with a different kind of, uh, a different kind of uh, injury profile, such as a concussive blast, say that you are in a vehicle that goes over a landmine and you survive the incident, which is occurring increasingly for veterans. All of these injuries that come about from very different mechanically uh, precipitating events can lead to similar changes in the brain. They can lead, certainly, to similar symptoms, such as um, changes in character. So people who have traumatic brain injuries, just as people who have other brain injuries, maybe they're a chemically induced brain injury, maybe they're an asphyxiation-based uh, brain injury, one of the most significant things that happens to people with TBIs is a, is a change in their personality. Um, thus far, I've noticed um, that there seems to be a very close link between PTSD, so that's post-traumatic brain injury, and, sorry, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, I apologize, and traumatic brain injury. Um, your body's very good at learning from experiences, and it tends to make associations when something happens. So when a, a situation occurs that leads to the brain injury, there is a rewiring of the neurons as well to associate that with being a bad thing. That's partly, that's one of the strengths of being a human being, is the way in which our neurology responds to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So it's not uncommon for people who develop brain injuries. Usually they develop a brain injury from something that keeps happening to them. Not just one event, something that happens to them more than once. So I'm gonna give you some data uh, of an individual. This person has been de-identified. Um, they are a mixed race individual of between 30 and 50 years of age. Um, this data is metadata from a um, an electroencephalopathy gram, encephalopathy gram, an EEG, um, and the metadata has been plotted, uh, and I've summarized greatly the, the data that was available from this individual, into some um, 2D schematics uh, overlaid with the brain, and I've given you a little bit of a reference point as well for the cortical data. So some things to take from here. I obviously don't expect you to read this. Please don't even bother. Um, you see there's a graph here. This is the distribution of normal responses. This is the distribution of TBI-associated responses. Uh, you don't have to process what the data is. Just look at the graph and see that this individual, um, statistically, in terms of the neurological, electrophysiological data that comes from the EEG, their responses put them quite clearly into the TBI rather than the normal. There's a tiny, see the bell curve there? There's a tiny chance that they're normal. There's a really good chance that they're not. Um, in fact, if you look at uh, another way of looking at this metadata uh, on terms of the curve from severe through to mild traumatic brain injury, they're right on the cusp. They're actually past mild and into moderate brain injury, which you think, well, it's a moderate brain injury. The thing is, the nomenclature for brain injury is terribly misleading. Um, I think mild brain injury should probably be called chronic. Moderate should probably be called serious. Severe is just, just right, right where it is. 
Um, a severe brain injury, you actually have neurological matter splatting out of the brain. If the skull is injured in any kind of way, that leads to material leaving the brain. That's obviously severe. The moderate and mild injuries does not necessarily mean that there's any obvious structural change. And in fact, um, it's often called the invisible illness. It's called the invisible illness because we don't know how to look at it yet. It's like saying that bacteria are invisible. Well, they are invisible unless we have an instrument. So at some point, we should develop the instrumentation to be able to see um, the invisible illness. Please go ahead. That was one of the things I was thinking about was you're pointing at the mild range, you say chronic. We, would Alzheimer's fall underneath that? Oh, that, this is a different story in terms of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's can be registered on this scale. That's probably not the right way to do it. However, uh, is there a causative link between traumatic uh, brain injury and topologies such as Alzheimer's disease? And it looks like there is. Um, I, I'm likely to say that because of, I've just submitted a grant uh, saying exactly that. So of course, of course I'm going to, uh, to, to trumpet that relation. I also happen to believe it. That's why I wrote the grant. Um, and I'm collaborating with the uh, Soldier Protection Services of the Army Research Lab right now, uh, looking at that very thing, specifically. Um, so, a little bit more about this individual. It's kind of interesting because you can't see anything wrong with them until you start interrogating their electrophysiological responses. They're a very, very interesting case. Quite an affinable in individual. Um, but if you look at the areas of their brain, and it's both hemispheres, look, Areas of the brain that are affected, they intersect directly with uh, Brock's area and the language, uh, sorry, the motor cortexes across the cortex of the brain that are directly responsible for being able to speak. This individual should have profound difficulties with articulation and possibly have some kind of oddness in their development of an acquisition of language skills. And in fact, um, they uh, present as having as substantial uh, problems, learning difficulties during childhood. They are profoundly dyslexic even into adulthood. So this is showing that the data works really well. Um, <coughs> however, they're extremely articulate because they developed coping mechanisms. This brain, this scan, is mine. I had profound problems learning how to speak clearly. I was 11 before I learned how to read in the end, partly because people were trying to engage me to use phonetics to learn how to read, which <laughs> I got problems with doing so. Uh, during my, my childhood years, I had repeated concussive events, including a coma. Oh, and I was born uh, without a heartbeat because I had a strangulated birth. So there's all sorts of reasons to believe that I should uh, have this kind of problem and this kind of presentation. Why is it, though, that I am an accomplished PhD a uh, multi-subject researcher with more um, titles and uh, accolades than I really care to be serious about, um, whereas somebody else with a similar kind of profile is not accomplished in this respect. We don't know. What is more, we can't see structurally what this electrophysiological data is telling us. All it's telling us is that there are problems. All the electrophysiological data is telling us is the neurons don't seem to fire enough. They're greatly under-regulated. We don't know why. We don't know what's wrong with the neurons. So this is partly where this research comes in. So I'm showing you, um, this is a, a myelinated nerve. So myelin is uh, in both the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. Myelin is wrapped around the nerve um, to increase the speed of signal transduction. I won't go into how exactly that's done, but it is a combination of chemical uh, ion transfer across a membrane um, that is aided and assisted by perturbation in the membrane, in the cell membrane of the neuron. And when you have myelin, then the signal transduction through the perturbation of the, of the membrane is able to travel further without degradation. And the ion exchange across the pumps that leads to that um, potential difference, that is that electric-like electric signal, is able to travel faster. That's why you have myelination. Now, um, there are multiple layers, as the Schwann cell or the oglodendrocyte, whatever it is, 
um, that is myelinating the, uh, the, the neuron, wraps itself around, actually it's this way around, wraps itself around the neuron, and uh, you get these successive layers. This is an electron micrograph of successive layers of myelin. Now, X-ray diffraction is, uh, is a thing that's useful in this context. X-ray diffraction is, uh, sorry, X-rays are a wavelength of light. They're notoriously difficult to focus. You, you don't really have efficient X-ray based microscopes at this moment in time. But what you can do is take the unfocused spectra of an X-ray and get really useful information, such as this is X-ray diffraction data from the series of myelin layers here. These lines correspond to the spacing. So these lines occur at the spacing that corresponds to the distance between the layers. X-ray diffraction is able to detect repeating structures with great ease and acuity. And because it is X-ray based radiation, its penetration ability through material is excellent. So you don't have to slice something that you're looking up into tiny sections to be able to see it with a light microscope or an electron microscope, for instance. You can leave things substantially intact. Um, so that's from 1957, and this is the substantially updated X-ray diffraction picture that we're able to uh, uh, achieve now at the beamline that I've referred to uh, just a few moments ago. A sample is mounted, an X-ray is sent through the, uh, the sample, and its X-ray diffraction, if you like, spectra, is detected. And that gives us a certain amount of information about the, the sample, the nature of it. So uh, I designed some experiments. I, I'm, I'm really excited to see the offset of the, uh, each of these slides relative to its contents. Sorry about that, but at least you can make out um, basically what's being said here. Um, I'm afraid uh, animals sooner or later do have to be used for this kind of research. Um, in this preliminary study, I was able to not sacrifice any animals. I was able to take them, uh, take the samples that were derived from earlier studies. Um, in this instance, a rodent is given an unfortunate date with an impactor, an apparatus that stimulates, sorry, simulates um, the injury that somebody would experience in, say, a car crash or having something heavy hit the head or the head taking a rapid trip to the floor while walking down the stairs. Um, so that occurs, then the brain is, uh, is minimally fixed, fixing as a, a way of maintaining the organic shape and structure of the tissue of interest in the first instance has to be done very, very carefully or else you lead to changes that are what we call artifacts. Um, the brain is then sliced and then put into the x-ray beam as we're indicating here. And the thing that I did that was new that had not been done uh, previously um, was take a series of x-ray diffraction patterns across the whole sample. So you see this looks, a, if you're familiar with brain sections from rodents, this is a rodent midbrain. And you can see the internal cavities here, the ventricles here, and then the cortical layers up here. What you don't know is that each of these pictures, each of these grainy pictures is actually an x-ray diffraction picture. Just like this. So each, so these appear in each of these little boxes here. The significance of this is apart from getting a kind of low acuity X-ray scanning micrograph, if you like, of the, of the sample you're looking at, is that each of these dots in here contains nanoscopic information, actually angstrom level information about structural changes that are occurring to the brain at that particular part of the sample that was scanned through with the X-ray beam. All right, so that, that was a relatively demanding bit of information. It starts getting a little bit easier uh, from here. Parallel to these experiments, we also took some optic nerve because they're easy to ident optic nerves are very easy to identify. They're big uh, samples comparative to other aspects of, of rodent neurons. And um, we decided to simplify our study of what kind of injury leads to what kind of structural change as much as we possibly could, and then put that back into the context of the more complicated circumstance of the brain. And so here's the control through the, uh, the, myel uh, through the myelinated nerve, the optic nerve. This spectra here largely corresponds to the distance between myelin layers. So that as it's circling the nerve, each of those layers as the myelin wraps around the nerve. This is basically what this is coming from. We discovered something completely new that's never been done in X-ray diffraction before. Um, we discovered this series of spectra that come from the nerve itself, the cytoskeleton of the nerve itself, the neurofilaments, as it were. 
And because we were able to accurately identify these two different components, we could study what kind of mechanical injury leads, sorry, what kind of mechanical delivery leads to what kind of specific cellular structure difference at an angstrom level, which was previously invisible. So what we found is, um, so a control, a 1.3 G, so G is gravity's acceleration due to gravity, 1.3 uh, gravities, 1.6 gravities. Um, remember, the nerve is largely intact from these uh, injury deliveries, but you see a profound difference in spectra, don't you? I.e., I, there are lines here, less lines here, really few lines here. This is less than two Gs. This is less than two gravity accelerations. Um, if you, in fact, we also found that 0.9 Gs, you get the beginnings of neurological structure change that's probably not good. Probably not good. Um, you could have that if you, well, if you fell down the stairs. Uh, in fact, possibly sitting down quickly could lead to these kind of uh, very minor changes. They're on the, on the scale of about 0.4 nanometers. So why doesn't everybody have a brain injury from sitting down too hard? or from being bored with a seminar and banging their head off hard vertical surfaces, right? Because you're still alive. Did anybody here ever had a cut or a bruise? Do you still have it? Right, most of you don't, right? Because you're alive and your tissue replenishes, it regenerates. So there are certain instances where this occurs and the brain either doesn't repair the injury effectively that was made even though the structure is still there, or it misrepairs it. Or the injury leads to a cascade of metabolic responses that later on, that would be your Alzheimer's disease, that later on cause some kind of profound neurological effect. So we're in the process of writing this up. Actually, it's written up. It's uh, under technical review at the Army right now before we submit it for publication. Um, so this is also uh, part of that same publication that we're getting ready to, to write. Um, I told you that this is a scan. This is a, there's the full 1,000 images are not in this particular, particular series of pictures, but this is a control animal, uh, three days post-injury, 30 days post-injury. And there's a couple of things to take from this. You can just ignore these two rows for now. Um, just concentrate on these. Um, so this is metadata taken from the X-ray diffraction pictures. And basically it's showing the extent of change in each of these groups. So the control group, this is the baseline. Three days post-injury, big changes. Well, big changes being you know, less than a nanometer, but okay, relatively big changes. Um, about four angstroms or so change. And then 30 days post-injury, somewhat back to baseline. Things are not quite as good over here as they used to be. Well, this is the side of the brain that was impacted. That's the side of the animal's uh, brain that was injured. And so you see on this hemisphere where there was injury, there's something that we believe is swelling. We're picking up on cellu cellular level swelling in the myelin layers. Um, and then a return to normal 30 days later. These rats, they were not specifically rehabilitated, but they weren't stopped from rehabilitating themselves. And the injury is a forelimb injury. So one of their limbs is not functional after this injury occurs. By the time they get to 30 days, they're walking normally again. So obviously the self-rehabilitation, -re obviously. Um, these graphs here as well are showing you the overall changes. Um, so this is the baseline normal. Let's just say it's about 76 angstroms that we're detecting here. There's a change up to about 80 angstroms and then we're back to 76 angstroms and day 30 again. So that's also quantifying the observation we're looking at here. Now here's really something that's kind of interesting. The opposite hemisphere is having a swelling change as well. It's not due to the injury though. It's due to the opposite hemisphere changing itself to compensate for the injury to its partner hemisphere. You've ever heard of neuroplasticity? It's the reason why I can speak. Some other part of your brain takes over the function because you have this exquisite redundancy in function and you have this beautiful plasticity in your, in your brain that allows you to cope for functions that you've lost or learning new stuff. By the way, if you wanna protect yourself from senile dementia, learn a new language every few months. It works, take on a profound new skill. 
uh, learn a, a new instrument every few months. Do crossword puzzles, right? Keep active. Uh, your brain is, uh, it, it benefits from mental exercise and also physical exercise just as much as your cardiovascular and skeletal systems do from physical exercise. So uh, this incidentally is the first time that these observations have been made, but also it's the basis of an initiative that, uh, that I'm involved in. Um, using some of the things that I demonstrated to you uh, uh, before in terms of the martial arts that I'm involved in um, and have my own uh, practice, the clinical study working on uh, ancient systems of meditation and mindfulness in the context of movement. Um, have you ever heard of Wudang Tai Chi Chen? No, of course you haven't. You've heard of Tai Chi, right? These kind of, kind of movements. Yeah, when I was studying Tai Chi, um, I didn't know it was supposed to be an old person's exercise. It was fight club. And, and my club participated in national fight competitions, martial arts competitions. And, and we were quite good. We had the heavyweight world champion, male and female, the belterweight world champion, the featherweight, featherweight world champion, the British champion. Yeah, it goes on. All in, all in my club. Um, it comes with a series of other uh, exercises that help you be in a restful mental state whilst you're active and moving. That's how you can be so fast. That's how you can be so flexible. That's how you can be so strong. Now imagine in the PTSD, if you learn a system that allows you to de-escalate your stress whilst you're going about your everyday activities. So that's why we're running a clinical study on that. And this is part of what this initiative is about in terms of building a veterans village in, uh, in uh, Illinois, and specifically to uh, give our veterans opportunity to have concentrated rehabilitation opportunities, job training, and so on. Um, and my group is involved in substantially looking at the science and the clinical applications uh, that will be brought to bear. Right, change of topic. Um, it, I'm not too embarrassed that the single most read paper I have ever published features the word dinosaur in it. Um, it's definitely not the most cited work that I've done. Uh, I'll, 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 sh I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a moment. But uh, Breaking the Fossil Record is, uh, is actually the title of um, a radio uh, interview that was done on me a few years ago in connection with this, uh, with this topic. Um, these, uh, here's the citation for a particular publication I'm going to make reference to. I also suggest you check out BBC Two's Horizon series on Mary Schwarzer who is the paleontologist who made this uh, original discovery, the, the hunt for life. Now their whole spin in the documentary is, wow, we found dino, dino DNA. It, it, that, it's a really minor. Funny you should say that. Yes, funny you should say that. So I, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Um, but what I'm going to do is primarily talk to you the bit that I did. Um, which is figure out, figure out a quantifiable reason as to why proteins are able to persist for what amounts to 68 million years or the equivalent of it. Um, and this has an awful lot to do with context. Uh, and some of us were talking about this a little bit before the seminar as well. Um, have you ever heard that something is impossible? Surely, right? I I'm going to give you a quote of uh, somebody who should have known better. Uh, by the name of Kelvin. You ever heard of the Kelvin scale? He, he, was, uh, he was the big cheese of the, uh, of the Royal Society, um, late 1800s, early 1900s. What did Sir Kelvin say? Concerning the speed of sound, it is a physical impossib impossibility for a man to travel faster than it. Oops. <laughs> we have no need for any of these Heisenberg theories, we have Newton's laws and understand the universe perfectly because of it. Oops. <laughs> Often impossible is a perspective. Improbable is probably a better word to say. Improbable, though, should have a condition attached to it. Improbable for a dog to learn how to win a spelling bee. Right? Impossible? Can you make some cybernetic alterations to the dog? I don't know. Right? So it all depends on how you limit the field 
of what it is that you're considering to be impossible or not. So in terms of biological molecules surviving for many millions of years, it's impossible! Uh, how do we know that? Based upon a series of experiments performed by grumpy men on a bench top uh, 80 years ago. Can we re-examine that at all? No, it's the perceived wisdom of science! Science doesn't have a personality, it's a system of thought and philosophy. Nope, science says! Science is not a database. It, it, I, I don't know what to say to you. This is a useless argument, right? So scientists say, have said, that it's impossible for them to persist this long. Well, you know, it gave us an opportunity um, to explore something really exciting and to get a publication that featured the words collagen and dinosaur in the same title. Um, so this is, uh, this is my life's work, summarized on one slide, uh, and badly summarized as well because it's a summary. Um, but basically, when I was a PhD student, the triple helical structure of collagen was the be-all and end-all that was really described about collagen structure, um, and I've been responsible for these other bits uh, in the meantime. Um, so I'm very, very gratified that my harebrained ideas about 10 years ago that were published about 10 years ago, yeah, it is actually the 10-year the anniversary of publishing a paper called The Microfibula Structure of Collagen um, that substantially changed the field's perceptions of how collagen is put together and why it matters. So basically, as far as this talk is, matter, uh, is concerned, those triple helices wrap around each other to make another fi a fiber called a microfibril. The microfibrils are organized in concentric circles to make up these fibrils. The fibrils get other molecules to attach to them and make bigger and bigger and bigger cylinders, bigger and bigger fibers. The um, whole reason why I got into this particular discipline um, I didn't know that solving this structure, this packing structure, I didn't know it was impossible. If I knew it was impossible, I never would have been able to do it. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you let other people define what you think of yourself and define your own limits, um, you're giving them much too much power. Uh, and we're in a particular time and culture, uh, sociological significance in history, that's as close as I'm gonna get to that subject. Um, where there's an awful lot of things that are said about a lot of awful lot of other people. And really, whilst it is sensible to listen to feedback, because people are seeing who you are and hearing who you are and can give you feedback that you can't get yourself otherwise, but if you let them tell you who you are and what you are and what you can be, and you let that define you, yeah, I don't think that's the best way of living your life. I was told to not be a scientist, for instance. Maybe they were right. I think they were wrong. Anyway, so if I had been told that this was, just a moment, if I was told that this was impossible, we wouldn't be standing here today. Um, we also wouldn't have a regeneration technology for cartilage that my group has developed. We also wouldn't have this insight into dinosaurs. Go right ahead. Uh, I didn't raise my hand, I was just scratching my head. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, the significance of this is that there are certain chemical groups. So this is supposedly representing where key chemical groups are located. Just notice that the little circles that hold these key groups are not on the surface here. So the surface of the collagen fibril is here. Key chemical groups are under the surface. It's the only thing you have to take from this. So it has been thought that fossilization is the complete um, ossification. It, 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 it's stone replacing tissue and that there's no tissue left. Oh, there's also the consideration that maybe the aves that we have present on the planet as well, maybe, maybe not, um, have some kind of biological relationship um, to certain strains of dinosaurs. So that, there's that question sitting around as well. That's, that's a chicken T-Rex, in case you couldn't guess. So let's uh, forward on to Mary Schwarzer and, uh, um, and her former supervisor. Um, they made an amazing discovery, a very large and intact uh, series of T-Rex uh, bones, complete skeletons that were found. And because of the location of the, uh, of the fossils, they had to do something absolutely unthinkable in paleontology. They had to, um, well, it's not unthinkable to have to helicopter out the findings because of the location. It is unthinkable to go, well, we have this beautiful T-Rex thigh bone and it's too heavy we're gonna to have to cut it in half. Well, it wasn't actually cut, it was kind of snapped in half because of the location. It's a travesty. Why would you do that? 
Well, because they had no choice. So they went ahead and did that. And because they did that, all of the innards that would not have been seen before were suddenly seen. And in fact, things that looked suspiciously like soft tissue emerged. I actually have a little portion uh, of this sample myself. And whilst collecting x-ray data on it um, with the video microscope that I was looking at, I saw a T-Rex blood vessel just for myself. It hadn't been exposed for who knows how long. It, it was a blood vessel. Went out, teased it out, found it. Beautiful. Um, so Mary Schwartz's group characterized a whole bunch of soft tissues, including blood vessels. And that, my friends, is a red blood cell. T-Rex, red blood cell, uh, found in tissues. However, this is impossible. And the prevailing view of science trumps facts. Yeah, it shouldn't, right? The prevailing opinion should not trump empirical observations. It does. You have to convince people that what you are seeing is real. And you have to convince them way beyond what is reasonable because you are second to the debate, not first. Well, this is a good question. I'll circle around and give you a more extended answer to that in a moment. But it's, it's yes, the fact that it is bone is significant. Tendons are not found, only the bones. And you remember, bones are somewhat stonified already by nature. They have hydroxyapatite, um, the calcium-based minerals that invaginate the protein content. Bones are primarily protein, specifically collagen, mostly collagen type 1, in fact. And then a series of mineral events occur in the structure of the protein that make it rigid. It sacrifices its flexibility and elasticity, um, makes it quite fragile in some ways, but makes it extremely good at making sure that this doesn't happen. Now, the um, various people who were unwilling to accept that uh, T-Rex blood vessels um, and other soft tissues had survived for whatever period of time it is, but let's say it's 68 million years for the sake of argument, because that's what the rock starter and the geologist said, um, pointed out that bacteria are able to make things that look an awful lot like blood vessels. Yeah, they do look an awful lot like blood vessels. They're nothing like blood vessels. Um, their chemical composition contains a certain amount of collagen, but one collagen is not like another. The kind of collagen that bacteria produce is as much like the collagen that you find in a multicellular uh, organism as a chocolate teapot resembles a functional teapot. It's actually not a bad analogy. Have you ever tried to have tea made in a chocolate teapot? It's, it's a little bit futile and amusing. Now, anyway, um, some people were willing to think about this a little bit more. We've not studied this particular phenomenon particularly well was the prevailing argument of some folks. And then my collaborators and I thought we can probably help Mary Schwartz's group out in figuring out why these proteins persist for so long. Because Mary Schwartz's group had actually not only succeeded in taking parts of the protein out of the fossils, but in sequencing, getting the chemical sequence for the peptides which was incredibly useful because then we could start merging the work that I have done with the work that they have done. Um, so I, I remind you that I take uh, bits of formerly living tissues. Uh, so this is not a real rat. I don't know if you could tell. Um, but this is a, a, a real bit of x-ray diffraction from a rat tail tendon. Um, and this is, uh, is very aesthetically pleasing. But probably what you, what you, you won't be able to tell unless you've read my papers or you are a fiber diffractionist of which there are about 14 in the world who might follow this. Um, this data extends to uh, four angstroms. And I, and I have uh, x-ray diffraction data from a natural crystallite from a rat tail tendon extending to 1.8 angstroms. At that level, you can see the individual side chains of the amino acids and so on. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. Um, this is data from a pig's eye. It's actually from the, uh, the collagen support at the, uh, where the uh, optic nerve uh, invaginates into the retina. Um, so that's the pig eye. See, it must be true. Um, and then this singing array of uh, extras from the movie Alien, um, 
they are horrible creatures. I, 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 I love all life forms except them. Um, and the reason is, is because they choose to be parasitic. They, they don't have to be parasitic. They just choose to be. Yes? Well, going back to this slide, make sure I understand. The bones are opened up and the bags Yes. So what kind of tissue were they? Are you getting? What kind of tissue? Um, it was specific, specifically, it was medullary bone. It was right in, uh, right in the middle of the thigh bone. Um, the tissue was extracted was, and the tissue uh, was uh, fragments of bone itself and blood vessels. So cross sections of osteums. All there was collagen. That this is exactly what I'm getting to. I'm just taking a sidestep for a moment to explain how we know. Um, so from this X-ray diffraction of tissue, uh, tissue bits, um, because I didn't know it was impossible, um, I determined the molecular structure of collagen whilst it's still in the tissue. Um, yes, this is my Sistine Chapel, ladies and gentlemen. Right, um, and then it wasn't enough for me to do that. When, I, when I'd finished determining this structure, this supposedly impossible structure, I had the audacity to want to know what it actually meant. What was the usefulness uh, to us? And I realized that because of the twistiness and turniness, I, I, I could go into more detail, but trust me, twisty turniness is probably all that you really need. Uh, of the way in which the molecules are orientated and the way that these, this is a microfibril, the way that these microfibrils, so lots of these guys stacked against each other to make these concentric circles making the fibrils, because of the way they're organized, not all of the collagen amino acid sequence is exposed to the environment in which cells are in at the same time. And that was revolutionary because I stopped and thought, oh, if they're structured like this, then the sequence can't be available because cells are, well, they're, they're not as long as a collagen molecule are, but they're certainly a lot broader than these particular structures are. So this is about four to five nanometers in extent. And cells, really, you should be thinking them of, of them on the micron scale. I, I love the idea that as soon as you give a name to something that you don't understand, you kind of go to sleep a little bit because you have a label to attach to it. It doesn't mean you get jack. And I'm not saying that to you, I just mean our general experience. Just because somebody says, oh, it's called this, and you go, oh, okay. Wait a minute, that explains nothing, right? So molecular crowding means um, it, it, you try walking through a crowded room. It's harder to walk through a crowded room than a less crowded room. That's all it really means. So the tighter and denser the packing of molecules in a particular space, the harder it is for other molecules or cells or bits of cells Pseudopedia, for instance, to be able to make inroads to catch hold of bits of those molecules. Um, so this is what I did. I, I have this uh, the structure here, and um, it's still a freaking nightmare to try and view all of the structure um, on a computer screen at once. There's, uh, in one 67 nanometer extent, that's one functional repeating unit of a collagen fibril, there are 14 billion atoms not including the waters. So that takes a little bit of workstation power uh, uh, to, uh, to get behind. And even 10 years on, uh, we still got to break the problem down into smaller units. Um, fortunately, my head seems to be, I can hold it in my head and turn it around and I can usually see which bit of the sequence is where because I've been staring at this so long that I used to have dreams that I was on a speeder in the forest of Endor in Star Wars, except the trees were made up of collagen molecules. So anyway, moving on, this is where we get to know each other as the oversharing, I suppose. <laughs> so there are certain sequences that we're aware that cells are particularly interested in um, attaching to, to recognizing. It's like a, a cryptobiological function. Um, so when a cell comes along to a bit of a collagen molecule, let's say it comes along to this bit here. This is on the outside. So the top here is the outside of the collagen fibril, and then down here, is the inside of the collagen fibril. And then there's another one of these down here, and then another one of these down here, and so on and so on. So imagine this is a cross section for a collagen fibril here. This GPO here is a very proline rich sequence. And you notice it's on this kind of peak. It's on the biggest outy bit of the collagen microfibril. So myself and my collaborators 
uh, published uh, an article that before it got published, we were forced to change the name. We called it the tough and bloody nose of collagen. Um, what can we say? We apparently weren't serious enough. Because being funny means that you're not being accurate, apparently. Um, so, uh, uh, but the point is, is that this is the most sticky out bit of the, of the collagen fibril. And it's the bit that is out there facing the milieu of the environment. So it's also the toughest bit. It makes a certain amount of sense. Well, the soft nougat chewy bits are down here. This is actually the, this site right here underneath the toughest bit, this site here, the MMP site, is the one, the one place in the entire molecule, the all 1,044 amino acids per peptide chain, um, that the body has an enzyme to cut. The body doesn't have enzymes to cut this, to digest it, except in the stomach. And if you've got a hole in the stomach, you've got other problems to worry about rather than the biological regulation. Um, that's the one site. And look where it is. It's protected by the toughest bit. Because when you think about it, um, when you have unregulated biological activity, when things happen out of sequence in a body process, that tends to be called disease. And so the tissues of your body, the cells of your body, with the interaction with the inanimate aspects, we'll call the cell scaffolds, such as this, um, tend to be tightly regulated. Things need to happen in an order. So for instance, here, if uh, a blood vessel, if, the, if this is part of a blood vessel here, if a blood vessel gets injured, this gets exposed, and um, passing by platelet says, oh, that's interesting. I don't normally see that. This means that I should stick to it. So a platelet sticks here. This is actually a high acuity sticking point for platelets. The platelet has in its plasma membrane an array of tools, of enzymes, much like a Swiss army knife, that come out and play, cut through here, cut through this little bit here, the C-terminal T, the peptide, this green bit, squeeze through here, cut through here, and starts scraping off layers to get to what it really wants, this GFO, GER site, and this VWF site here. These are the really strong, high acuity cell sticking points. And then once the platelet gets in there, other materials, other cells, other debris, other platelets come and attach and start clogging up the wound. Platelets are cell fragments that also mimic other cells. So your other cells in the body stick to collagen through this site here and this site here. These are very vulnerable sites to digestion. Very, very vulnerable. Well, guess what? Those dinosaur peptides, here and here, the most vulnerable bits. So how the heck did they survive so long when the tougher bits didn't? That was an interesting question. So let's look at that. So first of all, um, some of the things we didn't publish in here because we had such good data, we could actually not publish some of it. We actually took some of the data that lowered the integrity of other things that we're looking at in the eyes of skeptics and published it later. So this includes everything, the dinosaurs and the mastoderms that we were originally looking at. So the woolly, ma woolly mammoths and, uh, and, and mastoderms, the pachyderms. We found that there were a series of sites. So these colored regions here are the, are the peptides that were pulled out of Mary Schwartz's investigation of the tissues. And then we've mapped those sequences onto my um, collagen fibril work. And I quickly saw a pattern. Look, none of them are here. Only one of them is here. However, because I got this in my head, I could say, oh, that's the outside of the fibril. So that, I, if you like, if we give it intelligence, just for, the, just for the want of explaining this, this sacrifices itself to protect this area down here. This is not actually naked. It's covered by another molecule called decorin. It's one of those molecules that binds fibrils to make those bigger fibers. So this is actually protected as well. So that makes a lot of sense. This area in here and here and here are the areas that are most sensitive to premature cellular attachment and are therefore the most crowded regions of the molecules. And so they have a protection in numbers, in density, and molecular crowding. Now, if you think about it, if you have the molecular crowding and the molecular coverage protection combined with the fact that bones are already ossified, they're already protected and occluded 
from the environment because of the mineralization that occurs to them organically, let alone if there's an, uh, a fossilization process that encompasses the entire bones before there's an opportunity for those nasty bacteria-borne collagen enzymes to get in there, then it's actually highly plausible that these guys will survive for millions of years. And in fact, this is the, this is the most significant, significant score I have ever seen or ever um, processed myself in terms of the localization of these sites to what's called the integrin binding site. Integrin is the main means by which cells attach to the likes of collagen and so on. Um, yep, never seen anything like it. So, moving on without any uh, other to do. Oh, you wanted more? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, the section showed there was 67 angstroms. Uh, 67 nanometers. Nanometer. So 670 angstroms. You found those consecutively right now? Well, I, I'm not the first to find the consecutive nature. But they are consecutive. They are. It's called the Hodge Petruska scheme. Hodge Petruska scheme. It used to be called the Chapman scheme, but Hodge and Petruska were the people who found it first. Um, so it's a 60, for fibrillar collagens, there's a 67 ish. It's usually 67. Actually, in three dimensions, it's 67.7 nanometers repeat. I, I, could, I could bore for my country if you want. Um, uh, in some tissues, it's 66 nanometers, depending on the hydration yeah, streak. It very... It's a repeating cellular, uh, it's a repeating unit cell. So the, the longitudinal unit cell is 67 nanometers for sure. Um, I suppose I should also say for this, um, the other thing that we worked out, and, and my group is, I'm sure we were not the first ones to do it, but we probably reminded Mary of this, and it, it appears in the Horizons uh, uh, documentary. Um, we processed these sequences and found the best match to be chicken. T-Rex and chicken. I feel mighty, mighty when I eat chicken. So, so the last bit of the talk, plausible explanation for, uh, um, for arthritis. Um, so we made a discovery in my group uh, 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 several years ago and realized that it might have some significance for rheumatoid arthritis. And in our humility, we, we, we titled the manuscript something like a, a non-enzymatic means of degradating boring, right, and of degradating uh, or, or degrading uh, cartilage tissues. And the reviewers made us change the title to a plausible explanation for rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, I, I did not go looking for this. So this is the well, how does it benefit humanity question. Uh, the research that you must do must be something that's beneficial to humanity. Well, I was doing something that was beneficial to humanity. What I was trying to do, I came up with an antibody probe so uh, an antibody that can sense a particular chemical sequence and or shape to look for a particular molecular binding site. It's actually, remember those, those molecules I was saying that attach to collagen fibrils to make the bigger fibers? I was looking for the footprint of where they attach specifically. And uh, developed an antibody probe. Um, and I, have, I had a really harebrained idea, what I like to call a harebrained idea um, for detecting where the antibody is. Um, uh, I'll say it for the sake of prosperity, it's called isomorphous replacement, it's actually isomorphous addition, where you add a protein, you add basically electron density in particular areas in a systematic way, the X-ray diffraction can pick up on it. And because I had the high acuity structure um, for the collagens, I could tell precisely where that would be, even at a low resolution one dimensional plot. I could go in and tell exactly where that would be. So I developed this antibody probe and it worked beautifully for the type one system that we're working at. And since the sequences are very similar, we tried it for our type two model system. So this is bovine articular artage, uh, uh, cartilage, a uh, TEM, the transmission electron micrograph of that. And then my model system we've been using for years is the cartigulous fish. It's those animals that I told you, I, it's the only animals I hate, um, the blanfries. Um, so there are cartigulous fish, they have a very simple form of cartilage uh, relative to, to mammals. What's that? I, I didn't know that the lamprey's are contrahypnians. There you go, hagfish and eels are their relatives. Um, so you see each of these collagen fibrils or fibers are actually very, very similar, but their arrangement is different. This is interesting, not just across species, but also for your body tissues. Many of your body tissues are made from the same ingredients. It's the recipe that differs. 
you know, much, much is the same, analogous to um, the difference between the ingredient list uh, between omelets and scrambled eggs is pretty much that, but the preparation, the recipe, is what gives you the different result. So timing of way in which the ingredients go in with each other and maybe slight adjustments can lead to profound differences. And that's also part of the explanation as to why um, very small sequence differences for people who have uh, osteogenesis imperfecta or other connective tissue diseases can have profoundly different physiologies from people who don't necessarily have those problems. So anyway, we took this antibody probe and we applied it to this system, expecting to get x-ray diffraction data telling us exactly where uh, a particular chemical binding site is, but instead we got this, which was at first a little bit disappointing. Um, because what had happened is these fibrils had fallen apart into these. And it was at this point I realized that what everybody, including myself, had been calling fibrils could not be fibrils. These are fibrils. They're just much smaller than we ever anticipated before. These are fibril bundles. They're bundled together by those proteoglycans. That's the name of the, of the class of protein I was talking about, the molecule that binds together the fibrils to make the fibril bundles, i.e. the fibers, the bigger cylinders. Um, once we realized that this happened for a very simple cartilage, we went to a more complicated cartilage and did the same thing, and lo and behold, exactly the same thing happens. Well, what do you know? In early stage rheumatoid arthritis, the same antibody that we're using has been found to be prevalent. And so in our paper, we proposed a chemical cascade, a biochemical cascade, for the early initiation of rheumatoid arthritis that then leads to the full-blown syndrome as well. So that sounded really nice, and what we had was a model for a disease. This is where innovation comes in, a little bit of imagination. I looked at this and went, huh, these things at this level are indistinguishable from mammalian and human collagen fibers. I bet that I could chemically take these things and make human fibrils. So anyway, what happens? in this process is that uh, the antibody, so this is green here, this is that bundling molecule, this proteoglycan, this is the collagen fibril surface if you like, um, this antibody comes in here and it chemically com competes for this sequence here. And that sequence is key to holding this proteoglycan onto the fibril surface and holding fibrils together to make fibril bundles. That chemical competition leads to this situation becoming this. It's like untying the shoelace. So by dislodging that particular chemical sequence from the proteoglycan, the antibody causes the fibril bundle to fall apart. So I looked at this process and went, huh, I bet we can use that to re-engineer a invasive species cartilage tissue. That's what lampreys are, the Great Lakes invasive species. They are uh, ecological hazard. I think we can take them and we can make a treatment for cartilage disorders because this is what the primary collagen is. It's, uh, it, it's the type two collagen is the primary constituent of articular cartilage and other cartilages around your body as well. And the reason for that is um, engineered tissue, if you have the right cells, the right biomaterial scaffold, the right growth factors and so on, you can end up making something that is a bioengineered tissue. Well, we've done it. Um, I, I, I'm not going to show you the pictures because it's proprietary, because we've started the business and uh, we're fundraising right now um, and uh, probably going to, uh, to start producing the initial stages, um, which is an analytical product for other people to be able to study cartilage diseases and ways in which to improve cartilage regeneration. Um, can buy this material and go ahead and do their research while we continue to get the company ready to get through clinical trials which will involve animal trials first and so on. However, I can, with, um, with the right ingredients, with the right recipe, which we've developed, um, single-handedly with my hands and with, the, as I said, the right chemicals and the right timing and uh, the right tools, um, manually make a cartilage. And I've done it. And we've collected the data and we got the patent. Um, so, this overarching theme that I was talking, oh, the patent was actually, we, we applied for it a long time ago. The patent was actually granted in uh, October 4, 
uh, of this year, which is why I'm so blatantly talking about it here, because for years I had to practice security by obscurity uh, and not talk about it uh, whatsoever. Um, so the overarching theme here is don't let people define what your take on reality is. Take their advice, but don't necessarily take what they're saying is and is not possible as the be-all and end-all. Interrogate it, play with it, question it. Um, the key to getting around so-called impossible tasks often involves perspective change. Talking to people who have very different perspectives to you. It really does involve a great deal of communicating with people who are outside your normal interaction circle. It involves a great deal of reading. It also involves some sparks of inspiration and imagination. If all you do every day is exactly the same thing every day, you're unlikely to get it. That perspective change comes from doing different things, changing it up from time to time. It's part of the reason why I do the improv. It's part of the reason why I was, uh, my word, what was I? There was a very famous Austrian psychotherapist. Do you remember his name? Yeah, I was her for it. Thank you. Um, in, in Chicago City Lit's uh, production of A Case of Hysteria uh, earlier on this year, um, I'm currently cast as the uh, antagonist in a TV series called Kung Fu Redemption. I'm not sure it'll ever get produced, but we made the pilot. Um, I'm the fight choreographer and uh, one of the fight participants in a movie called The Lion's Den. That's uh, shooting at this time as well. Um, and I was in a movie called The Creeping, and I won't comment on that further because I might like to work with that company again, even if I feel a way about the movie they made with me in it. So, um, changing perspective, talking to people, not necessarily taking a done deal as deal, as a deal, and uh, spending some time exploring the problem with your head rather than with your head banging off hard surfaces, trying to attack the same problem in the same way every other person on the planet has been trying to look at it for 80, 100, 120, 2,000 years, using your imagination. So I think that concludes that. I will take your further questions. Competing antibody. Um, suppressing the antibody, it, it's at such small concentrations. It, it sounds like a good idea, but practically, it's like, um, I don't know, it'd be like hunting for elephants with an air gun. Except it's the other way around, hunting for air guns with elephants. But anyway. Um, there are, per, there are probably, although I would say it's not impossible, there are probably much more practicable and achievable ways of looking at it in the first place, like eating well. Uh, and when you get injured, getting the right kind of therapy. I, I, I kid you not. One of the things that I like to say uh, uh, to people who are 20 somethings or so on, um, uh, congratulations, you live in a generation where you can easily expect to make it to 100 plus. Uh, if you don't look after yourself now, the last five decades of your life are going to be miserable. Sorry to put a dampener on the Saturday night feeling. But, um, but uh, uh, making a competing antibody is certainly possible. Um, I think probably helping the immunity de-escalate is another way. Uh, and that's why I talk about what you eat uh, as one of those examples and what you expose yourself to in the environment. Um, your immune system is literally looking for trouble. And if you give it trouble that's problematic or poisonous or semi-toxic, it's going to associate that with bad things and react. So I guess that's what chemical sensitivity is. Other questions, if any? Yes, sir. To what degree have you possibly used stem cells in brain injuries in Re relation to Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, so, and other diseases associated with the brain? I have not. I have not. It's not my area of competency or practice. However, 
Um, there's certainly lots of, talk, uh, lots of talk about it. I'll tell you what intrigues me most. Um, every tissue of your body is very likely to have some small population of your embryonic, your own embryonic stem cells. They're already genetically keyed to who you are. They're already there. I wonder if you look after yourself better, whether or not those embryonic stem cells don't become sites of cancerous nucleation and instead can become part of, well, what the, uh, the ancient Chinese called physical immortality. Basically, it just means life extension. I, I, look, I, I practice Kung Fu. I have to make refer references to the source of the discipline from time to time. Um, but more seriously, and again, directly to that, um, whatever you do with stem cells, whatever the source that they are, they're not a magic bullet. They're a lot more complicated to use than you might imagine. And even if you are able to physically repair the damage that occurs, which, by the way, we don't really know what it is that is occurring. We just know that there are spaces that become fluids filled and that there are problems with, uh, with neurological processing or even the absence of those neurons, that they get degraded or they, or they auto, um, they basically commit cell, uh, cell death. Thank you. They can, well, I, I wanted to keep that plain, but yes, they go for adaptosis. They effectively commit suicide and very tidily clean themselves up afterwards. Um, even if you solve all of those problems, all the stem cells do is give you new tissue. Maybe. If you can get them to become the right tissue, because they might just decide to become a tooth in your brain instead of what you were looking for. They may be neuroglia, the support cells, rather than the neurons that you're looking for. Um, and even if you manage all of that, what about the information that the original neurons were holding, your personality and your memories and so on? So the solution to the problem has to be a lot more complex than we're normally willing to look at. And it involves engaging the person themselves, not just as a hunk of living meat that you somehow treat with magic bullets, but you have to engage the person, especially when you deal with neurology. There has to be a mindfulness and a, a conscious engagement of the patient to be cured and therapized because that's the nature of the brain. It's a direct function of its use. You described how you could take like the eel tissue and turn it into cartilage. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to uh, use a similar process to generate other types of tissue? I think so. It's definitely on my hit list. Um, the only reason I started with cartilage is because I already had inroads with it. Um, but once we've processed this a little bit further, we will sure as heck be making dermis and bone and other things. It's just cartilage, uh, it looks really hard and it is, but we got lucky. And so for us, it's easy. Now, to go back to what you were saying, I go into all the chemical makeup of spinal discs, so they're actually using animal tissue to make replacement spinal discs. Right. So we will use animal tissues to do just exactly that, except we'll remove the immunological aspects of it and we'll make, the, we'll make that cartilage to be human-like rather than animal-like. Oh, incidentally, because we've got this base constituent, we can also make animal cartilage for animals. So dogs and horses and so on, we can also, we can also cater to that market too. And also going back to what you were saying about the stem cells, mm -hmm. I remember going to a seminar a long ago, someone was talking about the stem cells, saying that one of the problems with embryonic stem cells is just what you're saying, they would not become what you would want them to, they would actually wind up becoming tumors. Or they just bleep up and die. They're, they're very unhappy with the environment they are in, and they go through apoptosis. Yes, sir? The blood brain barrier, does it operate in some way, something like what you're describing as, let's say, opposing change? I'm not sure I can phrase it. Yeah, I, 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 well, let's work on this together. Um, the blood-brain barrier is really, really good at keeping stuff out. So um, this fighting, this literally bending itself? It, it's a barrier. It, it, it's not completely inert. It's like a, like a security wall with cameras and guards, if you like. Um, but it, it, it's, it's got a... 
fairly narrow apertures for letting things uh, in, and it's well guarded with uh, immune cells um, to take care of potential invaders. So in terms of thera uh, therapeutics, it's a challenge to get useful therapeutic compounds across that barrier. Um, I happen to be aware of a group that has, um, frankly, an amazing uh, a vehicle for transporting therapeutics across the barrier. In the meantime, um, there's a way of doing it without fancy therapeutics. Um, biofeedback, neurofeedback. So again, this is a, a computerized use of, um, of your own cognizance. Uh, mindful cognizance is a, is a term that bounces around the Pentagon at the moment uh, in particular. Um, and then there's another way as well. Actually, part of your brain does jut into the outside environment in the nasal... <laughs> No, I'm not telling you something that's unfortunately happening to you right now. No, no, no. Um, part of the, some of the neurons in the nasal, uh, nasal olfactory bulb, rather, uh, jut out into the nasal pharynx. Phallax. It's part of the reason why sense of smell is such a profound, has such a profound effect upon personality and so on. Um, those neurons, um, actually, they trace right into the central neural system, into the brain proper, and just below the prefrontal cortex and the cortex itself. And they're there, dangling, sensing the environment, um, exposed to the air with every breath you take in. So when you're going, ah, smells like new paint, you're kind of damaging your head. Quite, quite profoundly, actually. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes wondered, I'm going to be careful what I say because this will appear on YouTube and who knows who will view it. But those people who work with uh, organic compounds, um, I, I must admit I've anecdotally noticed are kind of grumpy. And if you think about executive function, which is uh, the function that helps you order how you do things, uh, also helps you regulate um, what you think versus what you say out loud and how you behave, uh, that is right above that olfactory bulb. So if you've got those organic compounds doing whatever they do, which is probably not a good thing, um, to those neurons, then they just make their way up to that seat of personality and futz with that. Beware of what I said, I said futz with that. Um, there you go. So whenever, whenever I find a, a, a painted room or a strong smell of organic compounds and so on, I, I vacate pretty quickly. My personal anecdotal advice. Anyway, I have no idea why I monologued. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else? When you speak of PTS, PTSD, it doesn't have anything to do physically as far as the brain or the body. It must. Logically speaking, it must. Treatment of psychology mm -hmm. enters the picture of treating PTSD, doesn't it? By all means. But psychology is just a but, but psychology is just a discipline. It doesn't mean that what psychology, the discipline of psychology is helping treat isn't physical. Just because you experience pain in your head doesn't mean it's not real pain. In fact, all pain is just in your freaking head. It doesn't matter if it originates from some kind of mechanical or chemical action on the outside or if it's just emotional pain. It's the same pain. And it leads to similar neurological changes. So that's why I'm saying it must be physical, because I'm saying bio biologically speaking, there are changes that occur to neurology and the neuroglia that are a direct result of what you experience emotionally. As well as, you know, emotionally, whatever you experience, whatever you think about. Uh, incidentally, every time you recall a memory, um, you revise the memory with the state of mind you're in when you recall the memory. To add a little bit on that, on that topic, um, I mean, there is a pain gate um, theory that, that um, tells us that we experience pain, but at the same time, um, we can control a, to a certain degree the, the feeling of that pain. Right. We can probably even suppress it with the, through meditation or other techniques. And then uh, another thing, another thing uh, agreeing with you on the on the fact that uh, psychology is just a, it's a discipline, I mean, it helps 
treating uh, the, uh, the PTSD, it helps rewiring the brain mm -hmm. to try to uh, deal with that, with that disorder. Right. To try to uh, get a better outcome after treatment. But like you say too, I mean, there has to be a physical, um, physical um, correlation on the brain with, uh, uh, about the problem. Right. It is. And at the moment, we, we, um, we have difficulty visualizing. And it's primarily visualizing what these changes are. We, we have no means of actually tracing neurons in a living brain. So what about functional MRI and PET scans and stuff? That doesn't have the acuity of individual neurons. PET scans are looking at blood vessels and blood flow, and MRI is looking at shades of gray. Seriously, it's just shades of gray. Um, in, incidentally, I, I do have some harebrained ideas about how to make that no longer just shades of gray and actually be, be beautiful technicolor showing the presence of various molecules and um, particular ion groups, but that's probably next decade's project at this point, um, unless somebody else gets there first, which would be wonderful. Um, but for the most part, we don't, we don't have a mechanism for viewing what these changes are. And even if we look at the neuron bodies, so the myelin layer, layering, which is only part of the brain, by the way, I and mean, there's a great deal of gray matter, non-myelinated uh, uh, neurons. So, okay, we look at the cytoskeleton of the neurons. Yeah, that doesn't even touch the synapses. The synapses are another level of difficulty altogether, and they're much softer and much more delicate and much more vulnerable to fluidic forces, shall we say such as experienced in concussive events. That's all I'm going to hint at on that because I haven't been approved to say any more yet. Essentially, the neuroscience is still to scrape the tip of the iceberg. Um, it, it's not just neuroscience. I would say that a great deal of disciplines are just beginning to define what they really don't know on the basis of a large body of what we kind of know, what we think we know. And the sum total of what we know at the moment is just a model just a model of reality. And models are there to be revised as your perspective, consciousness, and understanding expands. And you all experience some degree of that. Or anybody who studies chemistry, when you go, oh, right, there's two electrons in that inner group and there's eight that, what do you mean it's a probability cloud? What the hell? Right, eventually as your expanding goes on, it's like, just, just a, what? Should have told me that in the first place. Well, you know, when you're six, you're probably not ready for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, maybe you are. All right, thank you.